Good morning, friends. My name is Rob Heron. If we haven't met yet, I am the campus minister with Reform University Fellowship here at App. I'm filling in for Scott, and I'm so glad to be able to speak from God's Word to you this morning. We're continuing to go through Paul's letter to the Philippians, and we're now at chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. So you can turn in your Bibles there and read along with me. Philippians 2, 12 through 18. And there the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This is God's word. I'm not much of a golfer, but I went to golf for the first time in about two years last weekend with my dad. And we went out to Boone Golf Club. And again, I don't know much about golf, but I know that a swing can be a very complicated thing, but it's also the kind of thing you don't want to overthink. I tend to overthink it or underthink it in two directions. Either I get too rigid and my form is entirely stagnant and my body is still, or I just try to let it rip and my body goes spastic, and all of a sudden I have no idea where the ball is gonna go. So at the beginning of the day, when we got out to the first couple of holes, I was too rigid, I was afraid of hitting the ball at someone else, and so I swung with very little movement, and the ball went about 10 feet. And I started getting embarrassed because I didn't wanna look bad in front of Boone Golf Club. So at about the fourth hole, I decided I'm just gonna let it rip. I'm going to try to be impressive. So I wind up like a slingshot and I swing so hard that I have to close my eyes because I'm expecting when I hit the ball, sparks are going to fly off of it. And when I hit the ball, I slice it, which is where you hit the ball and it goes in a C-shaped curve. And I slice it so badly that not only does it fly off of the course, but at this particular hole, we're right next to a residential area and it flies over the tree line, and I think probably two neighborhoods off of the course. I was so afraid that I just ran to the next hole as fast as I could and didn't even drop my ball after that. But I also didn't check the news that day because I assumed that over at the CVS on Blowing Rock Road, a car or maybe a couple got dented. So if you were at the CVS and your car has a golf ball shaped dent in it, you can come and talk to me. So, In my golf swing, stagnation or being too rigid is bad. And at the same time, just fearful energy pouring out of me was also bad. In the Christian life, stagnation or apathy is destructive. And at the same time, fearful action is also destructive. We are not called to be stagnant because God is has called us to grow and to move. And at the same time, we're not simply called to fearfully pour out our energy, believing that if we don't, if we don't act, if we don't do enough, then God is going to condemn us. So what is it that God calls us to? If it's not stagnation and it's not fearful action, what is it? And here's what we see from Philippians 2. Salvation is going somewhere. Salvation is going somewhere. And I want to explain this looking at Philippians 2, 12 through 18 and talking about three things. One, the work of salvation. Two, the direction of salvation. And three, the community of salvation. The work of salvation, the direction of salvation, and the community of salvation. So first, let's look at the work of salvation. And Paul begins in verse 12, so you can turn your eyes there. Therefore, my beloved, 
Beloved is a term used for God's people. And so Paul is speaking here to those who are already Christians, which is so important to remember in light of what he says next. He says there, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul, who has spent time with Philippians, is now absent from them. And he tells them, even though I am gone, you are that much further toward what God is calling you to. So continue to obey even more. His tone is, is humble and encouraging. You don't need me, he seems to be saying, to do what God has called you to do. And so look at verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And both parts of this phrase, I imagine, will raise our eyebrows and, and raise concerns. Fear and trembling work out your own salvation. Let's take the first of those, fear and trembling. There's a kind of fear that we all experience before we come to know Jesus, and that's fear of condemnation. As Christians, we're called to put that fear to bed because there is no longer any condemnation for those in Christ. But even after we become Christians, there is still a kind of fear that is good and appropriate. And that's fear not of what God is going to do to me if I fail, but the fear of the hurt and the offense that I will give to God when I turn away from him, when I sin against him. There's a normal kind of fear we experience anytime we hold something that is precious. And Paul is saying that your salvation is precious. So when you hold it, as a gift that God has given you, you should experience that fear of reverence. I no longer feel this way, but for a long time when I would hold a baby, I would be terrified, not because babies are scary, although maybe some are, but because I knew that I was holding something incredibly precious. A husband should not fear his wife, but he should fear wounding his wife. And so Paul says, well, you have the salvation that God has given you is so good. It's so weighty. And so treat it as such. But then he says, work out your salvation. And this, again, understandably raises our eyebrows because isn't salvation something that God gives to us? Well, what Paul is saying here is not that you must earn your salvation but you should work out of your salvation. This precious gift that God has given you, you must now explore it, practice its consequences in your life, enjoy it more than anything. When a husband and wife are married, they're at the ceremony, they are charged to work out of their marriage. You have this thing, it is now secure now. Again, explore it, practice it, and more than anything, enjoy it. And more than anything, Paul wants to make it clear to them in verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. When we work out our salvation, we are simply responding to God's love. And we are drawing from the resources that he has given us. It is all the way through God's work. This past week, Mary Lee and I and our son Robert, who is two, were at a summer camp and I was teaching middle schoolers and high schoolers, but in between the sessions, we were able to explore the campgrounds. And my favorite part of the entire week was being able to take Robert to do the slip and slide. And when we went to it at first, Robert was scared, but as he watched people doing it, how much fun they were doing, he wanted to go. And so I would pick him up and I would carry him up the hill. As we got to the top, I plopped down one of the inner tubes, I sat in it, sat in it and I picked him up and I put him in my lap. And we went down and the whole way, his hands are up in the air and he's, he's screaming with terror and with joy. And right when we get to the bottom, after I've held him tight and done all the work, he yells, I did it! From Robert's perspective, yes, he was putting in this work, but truly it was, it was me, not to pat my own back, but I was doing the work and I was delighted for Robert to get to enjoy that work. I was delighted for him to enjoy that work. God is delighted when we work out of our salvation because where he is taking us is so good. Where he is taking us that requires this work is knowing more and more his grace, his love. The work that we do is to enjoy more what he has done for us. 
And what this helps us understand is that salvation is not just about the beginning of our Christian life when we come to believe in Jesus, and it's not the end of our Christian life when we are fully and finally with Jesus, but it is the entire process of God bringing us to himself. And this means, clearly, we are not called toward apathy, because where God is taking us is so good, but we're also not called to fearful action, because it is, in the end, entirely God's gracious work in our lives. When we are apathetic, we are missing the reality that is so beautiful of growing more in appreciation for what God has done for us, but to to live with fearful action as if God has done something for us and now we've got to keep it. We might lose it if we mess up is to totally obscure what God is saying to us here, which is come on. I am, have done the work. I'm continuing to do the work. I will do the work. So now explore it, practice it and enjoy it. So that's the first thing here. That is the work of salvation. And second What is the direction of salvation? God tells us to work out our salvation, but what specific direction is that taking us? We find the answer in verses 14 through 15, where Paul says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. There's a few things that we can draw out from this. One is that we are not to move out of the world. Clearly, the world is not in the business of encouraging our growth in Christ. That's not its deal. And yet, Paul does not tell us to flee the world. So often, we as Christians have read Paul's words here and assume that he's telling us to do something kind of like what Arthur and his knights do at the end of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. When they go to the cave they want to enter into, and there's a murderous and monstrous rabbit guarding it. And when they see what the rabbit can do, they all yell, run away. Paul is not telling us to run away from the world. Instead, he says that God is working in us right in the midst of a crooked generation. Right smack in the middle of a sinful, broken, fallen world, God is taking us somewhere. So we're not to move out of the world, but we're also not merging with the world. Clearly, Paul is telling us we should be distinct from what's going on around us. Specifically, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Grumbling has to do with outwardly expressing discontent, motivated by a selfish desire to get what's mine, that the world is really there to give me what I want. And disputing is the internal side of the coin, harboring an attitude of constantly critiquing other people, judging them, resenting them because they don't do things the way that I think that they should do them, or they're not giving to me what I think I deserve. And Paul says, this is what the world does by default. You don't have to try to do this. But instead, we are to take the mindset, adopt the mindset that Jesus has, and Paul describes in the first 11 verses of this chapter, to count others more significant than ourselves. So what this means is we're not to move out of the world. We're not to merge or fuse with the world. We are to move toward Christ's conformity in the midst of a fallen world. We can only adopt a true posture of self-giving rather than self-interest, counting others more significant than ourselves by becoming more like Jesus. So the direction of salvation is Christ's conformity. Instead of uh, focusing on getting out of the world instead of focusing on becoming more like the world, our focus is to become like Jesus in the world. God wants us to become blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. He wants to, to take on family traits, to become like him so that the world would see his character, his goodness when they look at his children, to shine as lights in the world because God cares for this world. As someone who's worked in student ministry, one of my favorite memes is of Steve Buscemi's character from 30 Rock, where he plays Lenny Wozniak, a private investigator who at one point, he goes into a high school disguised to find out where there is criminal activity going on. And he goes into a high school hallway, and there the picture is Steve Buscemi, who is clearly over the age of 60, 
He's wearing a backwards hat, a shirt that simply says music band. He has a skateboard slung over his shoulder and he walks up to a group of teenagers and he says, how do you do fellow kids? And clearly the attempt is to become relevant for relevance's sake. And as anyone in student ministry will tell you, that is a failing game. The Wozniak approach, it will not work. But Christians are not to just adopt the appearance, the values, and the practices of the world. And at the same time, we are not to become different for difference's sake. That's not, all, that's not what we're called to do. Jesus was different, but he wasn't different out of desire to oppose the world. He was different in a way, yes, that confused his opponents, but he was also different in a way that would draw broken and sinful people to himself. His rejection of self-interest, his other-centeredness, yes, it angered many, but also drew so many magnetically to himself. J.I. Packer is one of the greatest Christian thinkers and writers of about the past 50 years. He passed away on Friday. Packer was respected by so many within the context of Christianity, but he was also respected by many outside of the church. And it wasn't because he was cool. He never wore dark jeans. He didn't hang out with celebrities. He didn't play an electric guitar. And yet he was respected. Uh, when he was young, he was running away from bullies in his neighborhood and to get away from them, he ran into the middle of a busy street and he was hit by a truck. And the incident left him with an indentation on one side of his forehead that he carried the rest of his life. And he received this event in his life the way he received his recognition that he got later for his writings, with humility. What people notice about J.I. Packer is that he was different, but it was a different kind of different. He was gentle, he was kind, he was brilliant. And more than anything, he desired to honor Jesus with every bit of his life. This is the kind of different that we're called to. We are called to be different because Jesus is ultimately relevant. When we are apathetic, the, the reality is that we're likely to just become like the rest of the world. And we may call ourselves relevant, but that's not the right kind of relevant. And when we are fearful, we will move away from the world thinking that this is what God has called us to, but that is the, not the right kind of different. When we sequester ourselves to only speak with other Christians, with those who believe like us, think like us, do like I do. The kind of different that God is calling us to is the kind of different that Jesus is. The kind of different that, yes, yes, opposes what is sinful in the world, but also draws the broken to himself. And we become like Jesus by working out our salvation. This is what God has called us to, right where he has planted us to grow up to be more like Jesus. That is the direction of salvation. Salvation is going somewhere. God calls us to work out our salvation. We've looked at the direction of that salvation, which is to move toward Christ-likeness. And finally, let's look at the community of salvation. And Paul is concerned that the Philippian believers would move together toward Christ's likeness, toward Christ's conformity. And he gives them a model for how they are to be concerned, which is his own life. So in verse 16, he says he desperately wants them to hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. The goal of his entire ministry is to honor Jesus by encouraging them to continue to move toward Christ until they reach full maturity, and until they enter into the fullness of God's presence in heaven. And so he says in verse 17, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. The offering language, it calls back to the Old Testament sacrificial system, where a drink offering would act as the finishing touch on the sacrificial offering. So Paul is saying, if my life must be emptied, drained, sacrificially poured out so that you may reach where God is calling you to, then I'm glad. I rejoice. 
And that's the model that Paul gives to them. So he says in verse 18, likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Your heart's goal should be to see what God is doing in me come to completion. And so by implication, your desperate desire to, should be to see every single member of this community make it to the destination God is leading toward. Full maturity in Christ, full salvation belonging to the Father forever. So the salvation God gives us is going somewhere and we're not going alone. In 1914, a guy named Ernest Shackleton, he captained an expedition of Antarctica, leading 27 men across the icy continent. Three years into the journey, their ship called the Endurance, it was crushed between land sheets of ice and it sank, leaving the men to deal with murderous Antarctic seals and cold as bad as negative 15 degrees. Uh, what makes the story of the Endurance so incredible is, is not just what they had to endure, but the fact that all of the men made it back home safely. All men survived. And one author uh, who wrote about the expedition says this of the reason, about the reason it's still so famous to this day. And this is talking about the moment the men arrived in safety. In that instant, they felt an overwhelming sense of pride and accomplishment, though they had failed dismally even to come close to the expedition's original objective they knew now that somehow they had done much, much more than they ever sought out to do. It was a failed expedition, and yet all of them making it back home together was the greatest accomplishment. To go where God is leading, we need one another. And the greatest accomplishment is us together moving where God is calling us to go. And so we need one another in a way that's different than what we expect. I don't just need you to encourage me as I go after my own goals. And you don't just need me to support you while you pursue your own goals. Instead, the greatest thing we need from one another is to encourage one another toward the common goal of salvation. Full maturity in Christ arriving fully and finally in God's presence. And we desperately need one another to do this. And this means that we can't be apathetic toward one another's growth in Christ in this season, especially in this season of distance. We're called still, even separated, to use every means at our disposal, prayer as well as all the means of communication that we do have, to encourage one another, to spur one another on, to continue trusting God's promises, to look to Jesus, to learn to follow him, exploring our salvation, practicing it, enjoying it. We need to do that together. And this also means that we don't have to be so scared of failing one another and having to ask for forgiveness because this is ultimately God's work in us as we seek to encourage one another. As I encourage you to move toward Jesus, I need to move toward Jesus. And when I encourage you in imperfect ways, I need to receive God's grace and ask for your forgiveness. One of the best ways, honestly, to do this is simply to share one another how I personally am learning in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a crooked generation, with my own crooked heart, to trust Jesus more and more and to trust that he truly is working in me, and that he truly is going to continue to take me closer to himself. But above all, we can be confident together that God is going to bring us to himself because of the salvation Jesus has accomplished on our behalf at the cross. He was poured out, the drink offering of perfect love, poured out on the sacrificial offering of his life for us. So in Christ, salvation is finished. It is a gift given to us. And therefore, we can confidently move toward him and know that our salvation really means we are going somewhere. And that somewhere is good. And that somewhere leads us to our good Savior. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the good news that you meet us right where we are, but you do not leave us where we are. So I pray that you would teach us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling,
but more than anything, to move toward Christ and to move together. And ask all of this in your name. Amen.